So take it away, Joe. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Robert. Am I coming through clearly? Good, good. Uh, when you get a little older, sometimes you get hearing problems. So you don't know if someone's actually hearing you or not. And you start talking loud because you think that they're far away. Uh, yeah, I really don't know what time zone I'm, time zone I'm in right now. I was uh, just in Africa. Couldn't get back to the United States because they changed the law that if you're not a U.S. citizen or have a visa or a green card, you can't fly back to the United States if you've gone through Europe. So I had to go to Turkey from uh, Nigeria to Turkey. Yeah, got to Turkey, went to get on the plane, found out they couldn't take me back to the United States. So I had to end up spending another two days at the airport, came in through Mexico and there's others in there, but that's not what we're here for. Um, I, I'm not a member of Engineers Without Borders, Robert. Uh, you summed me up pretty well there, thank you. And uh, I got invited by Engineers Without Borders through another group called Engineering World Health. And uh, Engineers Without Borders needed somebody who could assess ventilator conditions here in Guatemala at the beginning of the pandemic and help provide them with repairs. So this is gonna be no surprise with anybody who's worked in uh, developing nations, which uh, I'm not sure if we can include Canada and the United States on that list now, but uh, the ventilators end up donated, uh, end up being purchased by ho the hospital systems. They receive no maintenance. Number one, it's not a maintenance-based culture. So filters are dirty, uh, the equipment's dirty. If they do try to get maintenance, it's usually after something's broken, so parts are hard to get and expensive. Uh, the machines are always supplied by the lowest bidder, so you never see, you always see a variety of different equipment through there. The last biggest one was a whole bunch of Chinese built ventilators um, as we saw earlier with the chinese based oxygen concentrators need i say more humidity is a big problem always humidity is a massive problem and um, one thing i wanted to mention real quick on this is in my work here what i've been discovering is whereas old vacuum tube technology for those of us that might be old enough to remember vacuum tube technology yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, lots of heat, high voltages, not necessarily high currents, but we had less failure rate due to circuit board problems with that than we do with newer equipment. What I've been discovering at a microscopic level, and I think this is what's happening is in cultures like here where there's lots of humidity, we get fungus growing on the boards. I can't prove, yeah. Now I can't prove, but I've seen the fungus growing on the boards and at a microscopic levels, we're dealing with microvolts, milliamps, and what's happening to our clock signals on circuit boards. Stuff fails suddenly. My theory is uh, clock signals are getting into where they shouldn't be and so on. Stuff isn't booting, but it's a reason why it's not starting because the board's got some fungus on it. Very small levels of it, but it's passing just enough interference that stuff can't start up. I see some of your shape nodding your heads going, I think he's onto something. You know, it, it's, it, I face this all the time with equipment's just failed. Why? Um, let's get back to the ventilators. So technical staff on the most part aren't even trained to deal with this equipment. Even the companies that sell equipment, they're just selling equipment. They're not trained to repair it. So we've got all that. Um, so Engineering Without Borders asked me to assess this and we had a shortage of parts. So by the time we were gonna get parts, not, not only did you have it in the United States, let's say, but we had a shortage of parts here in Guatemala. All parts had to be ordered out of the States. So it's gonna take at least two weeks for the ordering plus the months that it was gonna take to get stuff in, but we need ventilators yesterday. Everybody's making ventilators, but they're not up to speed yet as to a ventilator. And then how do you deliver into a national hospital system down here, a ventilator, and this is some of the issues that we're gonna have, a ventilator that's been, I'll just use this, home brewed, home built, when nobody wants to touch it, 
because they haven't been trained on it. And then who's gonna be responsible if we have a problem? These are some of the issues we had to deal with here. A number of years ago, we had an organization donated a bunch of military equipment. Inside that military equipment was a gorgeous, beautiful, made by a company called Univent, a ventilator. It's the model 754. Wonderful little ventilator. Problem was, after 2000 hours of continuous use or 12 months calendar period, it comes up with a maintenance alarm and you can't run it. How do you reset the maintenance alarm? Well, you need all this calibration equipment. You need all of this other equipment. You need, oh, for goodness sakes, all we're doing right now with this is we just need ballpark. I don't need to know exactly how many liters a minute. If I got a good respiratory technician, they just need it to ballpark to get in and then they can work in closer and look, watching, diagnosing the patient as they're working and bring it into more detail what they need. These machines ran with medical air, oxygen, or it had its own compressor built into it. They're phenomenal machines, but you can't, you can't set the maintenance on them. You can't send them out of the country. I figured out a way by dusting off the cobwebs up here, remembering my old Windows XP Service Pack 3, which was the best Windows there was out there for those of us that remember it, and how to build an RS-232 cable. Some of you youngins out there have no idea what I'm talking about. An RS-232 cable with a loop back, a loop back because you had to feed, you had to program this machine with the software to go into the calibration mode and then tell it on a loop back that there's another machine there that you're not using the calibrator. And all it did was go to the loop back to say, yeah, I'm here. And then, and then it would reset the alarm. That was it. So we were able to reset over, I'd say around 60 of these machines because we needed stuff now. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great little machine. And I can see a lot of, the, a lot of what, um, which by the way, isn't made anymore. And the newer one's made by a company called, it's called an Eagle from friends of mine that have worked, friends of mine in Samaritan's Purse that worked in Italy said they had a 50% failure rate on the machines. So Joe, let me break in here because uh, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, we're a little right. bit over and I wanna keep, keep moving. Um, so let me just, maybe this is an unfair question, but you found a way to fix 60 of those machines how many lives did that save? Oh my gosh. I'd say it probably at least 60. Thank you. Thank I you. I don't have exact details. Um, I don't know how much, how much time do I have here? Oh, we're over. Well, you're over. Um, <laughs> why, why don't you just real take quick a thing. more minute, please? We're on real quick thing. I think that what we need to develop amongst ourselves is what I call the RWOS 1.3794 standard. That means repair without swearing. I'm done. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Joe. Um, you know, I, I am a very theoretical guy. I publish in math journals sometimes, but uh, guys like Joe who are in the field where people are hurting are very important for this movement.